On May 1st, 2015, Reddit user rbradbury1920 made a strange post to the site in which he wrote about his suspicions that somebody was breaking into his apartment and leaving post-it notes in random parts of his home. The entry read, On the 15th of April, I found a yellow post-it note in a handwriting that wasn't mine on my desk reminding me of some errands I had to do, but told literally nobody about. While odd, I chalked it up to something I did in my sleep, thinking maybe in my half-awake state I scrawled it so it didn't appear to be my handwriting. I threw it out and thought little of it. On the 19th, I found another post-it note on the back of my desk chair in the same handwriting as the previous note, telling me to make sure I saved my documents. I was freaked out, but there were no other signs of a break-in, so I set up a webcam in my house and aimed it at my desk and used a security camera app for it to record after detecting movement. On the 28th, I woke up to find another post-it note, this one saying, Our landlord isn't letting me talk to you, but it's important we do. I immediately checked the webcam's folder on my computer and found nothing from the night before, but my computer's recycling bin had been emptied, which I am certain I did not do recently, indicating someone had noticed the webcam and deleted the files. They were just saved straight to my folder on my desktop called webcam. Today, on the 1st of May, I found another post-it note, this time on the outside of my door with nothing written on it, and there also appeared to be post-its on many other doors in my apartment complex, all blank in varying colors. Do I have any legal recourse here? I have no proof except for the post-its, but those are written by my pen and on my post-it notes, so conceivably, I could have faked them. Would contacting the police get me in any trouble if they can't determine an outside source for this? I just want to make sure I'm not wasting anyone's time. Should I consult my landlord, those also living in the complex? The entry is already extremely odd and a bit concerning, but in a later edit, the uploader mentioned something that took his story to a whole new level of creepy. Edit, I pulled up a letter I received from my landlord back when I moved in, and the handwriting is identical. Could this count as evidence? After reading the post, most people would probably find it odd that the user's landlord could have any information about him that he didn't explicitly mention in their conversations. Based on the information in the post alone, it would be almost impossible for an ordinary person to figure out what was causing the mysterious post-it notes to appear in the uploader's apartment. The unusual nature of the entry made more than a few users think that the uploader was making the story up. So, the handwriting is identical, and the landlord wrote that the landlord doesn't want the landlord to talk to you? You're probably sleepwalking. Also, I think you're making this up because you're not providing enough detail. Are they showing up after you wake up? So they were there at night? Did you find the post-its coming home? Did you find the one behind your desk by chance or noticeably the same day? Others jumped into the thread to give the uploader advice. Get one of the door locks that can only be unlocked from the inside. If it's the landlord and he is using his key, then he won't be able to get in, at least through the front door. But it wasn't until several hours later that another user named Kakerlack responded to the entry with a comment that took the thread in a very different direction. You seem sincere, and this doesn't appear to be the plot of a Ray Bradbury story. It's possible that your landlord is leaving notes inside your apartment, but they don't make any sense in the context you're describing them. It's likely that you're writing the notes yourself, but you are forgetting. Do you use post-it notes as reminders in any other parts of your life or job? Yes, this might be a mental health issue. You might be experiencing some sort of dissociative disorder. Or it might be a physical problem. You mentioned that you have a very unusual narrow bedroom with no windows. Is there a chance that you are not getting enough ventilation when you sleep, or that there is a carbon monoxide leak in the building? A cheap CO detector, which you should have anyway, is a fast way to find out. You also have really bad headaches. You know your own medical and mental history and your other experiences. If you think these incidents might be you writing notes to yourself, there's no shame in getting someone qualified to give you an opinion. As you probably know, carbon monoxide is an odorless gas that is incredibly dangerous for humans. At low concentrations, it can cause headaches, dizziness, and confusion, but at high levels, it can easily kill you. For Kakerlack to know that the user had an unusually narrow bedroom with no windows, he would have had to go through some of R. Bradbury's older posts, which is ultimately what gave him enough information to come up with a solid hypothesis and potentially save the uploader's life. Three years after the incident, WBUR Boston Public Radio turned the thread into a podcast episode as a part of their endless thread cooperative project with Reddit. In the episode, they interviewed Kakerlack, whose real name is Ken Roach, an engineer who had been through a similar experience with carbon monoxide. When asked about how he came up with his hypothesis, he replied, There was a past post where R. Bradbury1920 was asking in an interior design subreddit about how to fit a desk and bed into a really, really narrow apartment that they were moving into that didn't have any windows. 
That got me thinking, gosh, an apartment in Boston with no windows, of course they're hallucinating. Their landlord is not coming in and writing notes, but why are they hallucinating? R. Bradbury replied to Kakerlak's comment just a few minutes later saying, I have had really bad headaches, and I actually already do have a CO detector. Guess I should probably take that out of its box and plug it in. The fact that the uploader incorrectly set up the webcam and assumed the files had been deleted was probably related to the confusion caused by carbon monoxide poisoning, a theory that many of the comments in the thread seem to echo. Following the original uploader's reply, several users jumped into the thread to praise Kakerlak and highlight how badly things could have turned out if he hadn't been active on the thread at that exact moment. Kakerlak just saved your life, R. Bradbury 1920, literally. Seriously, send that guy money. The probability of joining these two people, one with the problem and the other with the ability to pick out the details and propose a hypothesis, is absolutely insane. R. Bradbury 1920 could have choked on himself for years before reaching this conclusion. Talk about crowdsourcing information. In a comment that he made on another post a couple of years later, R. Bradbury provided a few more details that clarified his situation a little more. In my case, it had to do with my bedroom not having windows. It was not technically a bedroom, but cheap apartments and rules don't get along, and my unit being directly over the parking garage. There were numerous other issues with the building that further facilitated the severity of my situation, including, as you mentioned, issues with the furnace and ventilation. Since the incident in 2015, R. Bradbury has been active on several threads, replying to people who were in similar situations to him and helping them understand the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. After Kakerlak's life-saving reply in the original post, there was one small detail that was left unresolved. Why did the landlord's handwriting match the writing on the post-it notes? Although R. Bradbury never commented on the matter himself, other Redditors in the thread came up with their own theories. Bit late to the thread, but how does that explain the fact that the notes had the landlord's handwriting? Guess I hadn't caught that. Either everything is a lie, his handwriting looks odd when he's tripping on carbon monoxide, or he was just being paranoid. That doesn't explain how the landlord's handwriting looks identical to the post-it notes. Bad handwriting while blacked out mixed with paranoia? I don't know man, I'm not the OP. Considering the uploader initially thought the post-its were being left there by the landlord, it's highly likely that he imitated the handwriting from the letter in his confused and potentially paranoid state. This is the only loose end of the incident that was left unresolved. But one thing we know for certain is that if Kakerlek hadn't replied to the post as quickly as he did, things could have ended tragically for R. Bradbury, and probably some of his neighbors as well. At around 1am on October 4th, 2010, Reddit user Khaled the Gypsy posted a concerning entry with the title, Does this mean the FBI is after us? Me and my friend went to the mechanic today, and we found this on his car. I'm pretty confident it's a tracking device by the FBI, but my friend's roommate thinks it's a bomb. Any thoughts? Edit 1. I should also clarify that the FBI had an interest in my friend since his father passed away, as he was a religious leader and they've made attempts at contacting my friend to spew racist questions. Edit 2. I should have been more clear when clarifying, but religious Muslim leader, and I'm an ENT. But it was my friend's car, and he doesn't use Reddit. My plan was to just put the device on another car or in a lake, but when you come home to two stoned people who are hearing things in the device and convinced it's a bomb, you just gotta be sure. Edit 3. More pictures. Edit 4. People keep repeating some posts, so I'll address the more frequently asked questions here. The device was found near the exhaust, but further in. My friend's father was a Muslim religious leader. It is not an ex-girlfriend that placed the device on his car, nor some random other employer or such. He bought the car a little under a year ago, and it wasn't there for sure then. Last edit. I'm doing another post because the story has many new developments, hopefully within a few hours. A comment that quickly rose to the top read, It's a Guardian ST820. It's a GPS tracking unit made by the company Cobham. The product line is called Orion. The Redditor who said that the battery and magnetic unit is handmade is wrong. You've got the standard kit. It's sold like that by Cobham. Sales is restricted to army and law enforcement. Too long didn't read, yes, FBI or police is after you. Naturally, other Redditors joined the thread with all kinds of questions and comments, especially regarding the legality of tracking someone who presumably didn't have a criminal background. It was recently ruled that if your car is in your driveway, it's in a public place and the police can put any kind of tracking device they like on it. Welcome to the free world. That's more than a little terrifying. Which is why you park your cars in the garage. Would it then technically be illegal to remove it? Why is it so big? That looks like a GPS tracker from 1992. 
because it was built for performance and durability and not to make roadkill envious. The large cylinder that looks like a mag light is a battery pack that will power the thing for weeks. At one point in the discussion, the OP asked, Are there any lawyers in this field reading this? If yes, please advise. I am. My advice is that you get your friend a lawyer fast. On October 7th, 2010, just two days after the original entry, the OP posted this update. Update 2, does this mean the FBI is after us? The original post here is the first part of the story. That being said, the follow-up for my friend's story is actually on Wired.com as a story there. The FBI is actually now trying to get in touch with me about some posts. So as not to anger our government agency any more than I already have, I won't be posting a lot about that, but feel free to ask any questions regarding my friend and I. According to the Wired.com article, the FBI sent a half dozen agents to the uploader's friend's house in Santa Clara, California, less than 48 hours after the original Reddit entry was posted. From my research, Cal the Gypsy's friend, then 20-year-old Yasser Afifi, is the son of the late Aladdin Afifi, former president of the Muslim Community Association in California. Although Aladdin himself moved to Egypt in 2003, his son Yasser returned to California alone in 2008 while his father and brothers stayed in Egypt. Because of the government's perception of his father's work, he had been on a federal watch list for a while and was regularly taken aside at airports for secondary screening. On the day he was visited by the FBI, the agents demanded their tracking device back and made it a point to let Yasser know that they knew pretty much everything about his life, including where he and his girlfriend frequently went out to eat, that he had been laid off from his old job and hired at a new firm, and was planning a business trip to Dubai soon. After interrogating and intimidating him for a while, they brought up the fact that his friend Khaled, the original uploader in the Reddit thread, had recently made a blog post on another site that allegedly had something to do with a mall or a bomb. After an unidentified person called the FBI to let them know Yasser and his friend were threats to national security, the two friends were immediately flagged, even though it was later found out that Khaled's blog post was meant as a casual joke in an online forum. Eventually, the FBI left both of them alone, but the case caught the attention of the American Civil Liberties Union as the tracking device was installed following a recent ruling saying it's legal for law enforcement to secretly place a tracking device on a suspect's car without getting a warrant, even if the car is parked in a private driveway. As soon as the whole mess was cleared up, Yasser and Khaled's case was used to challenge the ruling on tracking devices, which is a battle that continues to this day. The two friends haven't been bothered by the FBI again. On January 21st, 2016, a Reddit thread titled, To those who have accidentally killed someone, what went wrong, was started by a user on the site. Although the entire discussion was later deleted by moderators, I was able to find the original post using a Reddit Wayback Machine. In the days following the upload, the thread received almost 7,000 upvotes and more than 10,000 comments with people confessing to all kinds of horrible crimes they had accidentally committed in the past. As in any other Reddit discussion, most of the responses were obviously fake, however, a few of them were actually believable. Not sure if it was an accident, but while in college in my first apartment, I came home from work at 3am. Some dude was in the hallway outside my door, and I had a bad feeling about it. I paused and went to get the mail, hoping he would leave. Nope, I came back and he was waiting at my door. I asked him what was up, and he said he was looking for John. My name is not John, and I lived alone. I asked him to move and let me in my door. He told me to F off and get John. I slid between him and the door, opened it, and he pushed his way in. I pushed him out. He took a swing at me. I swung back, hitting him in the eye, which caused him to fall back and hit his head. Out cold. Forever. Apparently, John was the guy who lived in the apartment before me. The dead guy spent five years in jail because of John ratting him out for drugs. Dead guy came back to get some revenge. Got dead instead. Most of the comments were similar in nature to this one, but one particular response made by a now-deleted account stood out more than any of the others. This still haunts me to this day. As kids, we had a hideout in a dirt cliff slash cove. This is the best approximation I can find on Google, only three times taller and probably ten times as wide. There was a neighborhood kid who, in hindsight, was probably mentally handicapped in some way, but to us he was just the weird slash creepy kid. This was the 80s and we weren't exactly raised PC. Three of us were headed to our base and found creepy kid sitting on top of our guard chair. We yelled at him to get out and he said something like make me and started lobbing dirt clods and sticks down at us. We all ran around the side to make our way up. It gets pretty fuzzy here but all I remember is he fell. I still remember the sound. When we got back down to check on him he was in a very awkward position with blood coming out of his mouth. 
We all just freaked out and ran home, and as far as I know, no one has spoken a word of this to anyone. We didn't go back for over a month, and never said a word of it between us. Again, this was the 80s, so media wasn't like today. Chances are I got a small article in the newspaper B section, missing mentally disabled child found dead after fall, or something like that. Most of the responses to that confession were pretty unremarkable, but one comment sparked a mystery that remains unsolved to this day. Was it Scott Kleesholt? He went missing in 1988 in St. Charles, Missouri, correct? That would make you around 10 or 11 at the time he went missing. He would have been 9. The fact that the response included such specific information on a particular case raised a red flag for many users of the platform who went to do their own research on the case. According to what I found, Scott Kleesholt was a young boy who grew up in the 80s about 20 minutes from St. Louis, across the Missouri River. He loved playing outside in nature and spent most of his time exploring an area near his home known as The Trails, where the locals went to bike and hike and explore the vast network of underground caves and tunnels. June 8, 1988 was the day of Scott's first grade graduation. His parents had promised him that they would buy him a new pair of shoes and take him out to dinner to celebrate the occasion, and when he got back from school, he went to The Trails to play while he waited for them to get ready. To make a very long story short, Scott never came back, and his disappearance was immediately reported by his family. Unfortunately, a violent storm broke out that night, followed by a series of flash floods, which complicated the search for the boy. Despite the leads that popped up in the case over the years, the disappearance of Scott Kleesholt remains a mystery to this day. In 2011, the case was featured on an episode of Nancy Grace, in which Scott's older brother gave his account of what happened on the day of his brother's disappearance. Who was the last person to see him? Um, as far as I know, family and friends would have been my older sister, Stacy, before she had left uh, for work and stuff. And she was there when he had come home and changed after, after school and that. So as far as I know, it was, it was Stacy. And what did Stacy see? Um, he was, the last time she had seen him, he was at the top of the hill just um, playing, running around, being a, being a kid like we did, you know, I know. People say not to play in the streets, but that's where we played, up at the top of the street, and, and that's where he was. And this was a fairly urban but rural area, too. You were sort of out in the country, right, where kids just could feel free to play? <clears throat> yeah, it was a neighborhood. I mean, it was a, a neighborhood full of 100 kids probably in the neighborhood, but, you know, right five minutes from our house was nothing. Um, farmlands and fields and... How, and dirt trails and stuff like that. How violent was that storm late afternoon? And did you think your brother had, had just hidden to, to, to have cover? Yeah, it was, it was a pretty bad storm. Um, you know, it just came and went pretty, pretty quick. Um, you know, I don't think he hid necessarily, like hid somewhere. We just assumed that he was inside someone's house, you know, playing inside with another friend. Um, you know, and that's just kind of then started knocking on doors on every door. What's most disturbing about the Reddit comment, however, is that almost immediately after the user posted the comment regarding the accidental potential death, the confession, along with his entire account, was deleted, which came off as extremely suspicious to other Redditors in the thread. According to the St. Louis Post, Scott was last seen in the 3300 block of Leverens Drive near the trails. Based on the current Google Maps aerial view of the location, the description of the area by the Reddit user initially doesn't seem to match up with the images, but one user on another thread mentioned that, The location that is now Fox Hill Park in St. Charles had dirt trails and several steep gorges cutting through it in 1990. It's a little over a mile by foot from the last sighting of Scott Kleeshold. Route I-370 wasn't built then, so it was accessible by foot. Today it has been graded somewhat and has stormwater management areas, but you can still see the cliffs. Based on this account, it's not hard to see how the Reddit user's story could match up with what actually happened. Although none of this is certain, the similarities between the two accounts, coupled with the fact that the user deleted his account after being called out, made it a very real possibility that he was somehow tied to Scott Kleeschultz's disappearance. Even though the entire thread was deleted by moderators, the user who responded to the confession and suggested the boy being described could have been Scott posted an update that same year in a different thread to make sure the post got the attention it deserved. I'm only posting here as it was removed from r slash ask reddit and they didn't seem keen on the idea of reinstating after I removed the potentially identifiable info, and if this has any chance of getting public awareness on these kids or this story and potentially bringing some closure to the families of the missing ones, then I want people to see it. 
Since that day in 2016, there have been no further relevant updates to the case, which means we'll likely never know what happened to Scud or if the mysterious Redditor had anything to do with it. On July 29th, 2019, user throwaway 123 posted an entry in the Afraid to Ask subreddit which ended up getting over 20,000 upvotes and thousands of comments and replies. The title of the entry was, 12 mysterious and identical stores open up on my street, what could be happening? It read, I live just outside a big city in what resembles a suburban main street. Like many suburban main streets, retail business has been rough and they've all closed down. After a month of nothingness, suddenly 12, yes a dozen, identical convenience stores pop up. They look the same, they aim for the same floor plan, they sell the same products at the same prices. The names are all tiny variations of each other, like Town Name Mart or Market of Town Name, and all clearly bought their signs from the same place as the fonts, colors, size, and shapes are all identical. These stores see no business that I've ever witnessed, yet have large staff numbers and are surviving way longer than any of the former stores that closed on this street. When I enter one, they all stare at me while I shop. I don't usually get nervous, but it feels like they're staring threateningly rather than intently. They only accept cash unless you pay some $50. Most of their products are Walmart brand great value products being resold for higher prices. Most of the products are expired food products. I bought bread from one without checking because I was in a rush, and it turned out it was two months expired. Upon returning to show them, I found the entire shelf was expired foods. What was even grosser was the dairy cooler which had ancient milk products. I'm so confused, I feel like I'm in an episode of the Twilight Zone. What's probably happening here? Update 1. Stayed late at work and didn't end up going yesterday. Sorry for the swarm of people who did remind me with one day. I'm reading through the comments to determine what to do, if anything at all. Sorry for the less than eventful update, but given how many people were saying I was going to die, I'm just going to point out that I'm alive and well. At first, other Redditors in the thread were understandably confused at why 12 identical and highly suspicious stores would suddenly pop up in a random suburban neighborhood in an unnamed town, and several users jumped in to ask for pictures of the location. Can you take pictures, please? Yeah, if it's a criminal organization, this probably isn't the best idea. This is actually the craziest story setup I've heard in a long time. Does every single one have the creepy employees and the expired food? All of the stores have expired food and seem to refresh every several weeks. One I found makes a noticeable effort to keep things fresh but still has old dairy products. Does the food actually refresh or does it just rotate through the stores? You said one store usually has fresh food. Is there a chance that they buy it from the distributor and then act like the distributor for the next store, so all 12 stores are always stocked but they only have to buy it once? This is crazy, but it also makes so much sense. Because the OP took a while to answer in the thread, other users started coming up with theories regarding what could be happening, with most of the speculation pointing to a potential money laundering or human trafficking scheme. One user with a now deleted account shared a similar experience by responding, Thousand percent money laundering. We had a pizza place on my block that was always open but never sold any products. One time, shortly after I moved here, I walked in and asked for a slice, and the guy at the counter stared at me looking confused, then walked into the back. He came back out with, I'm pretty sure a slice of pizza from the Domino's next door that had been reheated in the microwave. He just slid it over to me and said nothing, so I had to ask for a price. Again, he looked genuinely confused and was like, uh, four dollars. Apparently, everyone in the neighborhood knew what was up, so the guy didn't understand why someone was there looking for pizza. Other users had different ideas. That's it, I bet it's human trafficking. The concept being that they pop up stores where they can rotate 4-6 to six employees from the stock room to the front. With 4-6 to six employees available 24 hours, you could definitely bring in the cash to justify a small retail space in a small town, and expensive property costs. Is your small town close to a larger metropolis by chance? Yeah, it's either for drug trafficking, human trafficking, or some type of money laundering. Stay away. When the question of why whoever was behind the operation would open 12 stores instead of just one or two, if it really was human trafficking or a drug operation, user AlphaPad23 replied, My thought is that they aren't afraid of getting caught. It's likely that they have some people in their pockets. While it's definitely a possibility that the stores were being used as a front for a trafficking or laundering operation, other users had slightly different theories, including user Goose and Fish who replied, What county is it in? One slightly less shady possibility is some sort of tax shelter. 
open a lot of business that fail and write off losses. Are the employees all the same ethnic group? Not trying to be racist, but maybe some rich family is trying to hide money in another country by buying foreign real estate. Maybe they have to make businesses appear to be legit in order to not pay taxes. This may be the best guess on here. That explains the expired food. In the hours that followed the original post, the LP remained somewhat active on the thread, vaguely answering questions about the location of the stores and other details that his fellow Redditors were curious about. In one of the comments, Iceman Throwaway123 mentioned, I hope this isn't giving away my location details, but the town is old. Not the town, but the people in it. It's basically a retirement community, and I often joke I'm the youngest person in the whole zip code by 30 years. Honestly, might be true. I don't have many people to talk to about it. I did have friends over a month ago who I showed. Their reactions were like mine, shock and disbelief. But we were drunk and more focused on having fun than chasing conspiracies. Eventually, because the uploader failed to post any pictures, or even mention the location of the town, more and more Redditors started to assume the post was fake. Look, you made a throwaway. Why not say the city slash area or at least give us some hints so we can conclude it ourselves? This sounds so bizarre that it has to be fake. There has to be some way to get authority involved if all they sell is expired goods. Dude, this reads like a creepypasta. That's because it's fake. Hmm. No updates. Suspicious. No update, no pictures, no name of town. I kind of doubt any of this is real. After a few days, the OP stopped responding altogether. That was the last post, comment, or thread he ever participated in with that account. Whether or not this story is actually true is still up in the air. The post remains a mystery to this day. In 2011, the subreddit The Truth Is Here was created for people to share personal encounters with the paranormal and unknown. Since its creation, the subreddit has seen a lot of odd and interesting posts, with some of them rightfully being very disturbing. On September 9th, 2013, a user posted the following entry from a now-deleted account. This is not something I feel I can discuss with my family or personal friends, but I'm losing my mind here, so I feel the need to work through it with someone. As such, I'll try to give as many details as possible, but I don't want this getting back to me, and I feel a throwaway account would cost credibility. Here's what's going on. I lived in this apartment complex four years ago when I was 16 years old. We did not stay here long due to problems with the lease, but during that time I spent quite a few hours walking around the grounds. Now, on the east side of the complex is a bike trail that's raised up on a slope. It makes a half circle around the complex and then carries on into the rest of the city. One night, I was walking my dog Shasta along this trail. It was around 10pm in May, so it was pretty dark at that point. I reached the bend in the trail where the path leaves the complex, and there was a guy standing there. White guy, maybe 35 years old. Couldn't see his eyes. He was not doing anything. Smoking, walking a dog, tying his shoe. He was doing nothing at all. He was wearing a puffy down coat and had his hands in his pockets, and he was just staring at me. I laughed a little and tried to make that awkward kind of conversation that you do when you bump into a stranger, but the guy said nothing, just kept staring. So me and the dog sidled around him and walked on, but I eventually got nervous and cut through the trees to get back to my apartment without going on the trail again. I knew the way home from there, even without the trail, but here's the thing, the second I stepped off the trail, I can't remember anything past that. It was like I blinked, and suddenly I was in the hall inside my building, turning a key in the lock of my apartment. Fast forward three and a half years, I was 19, seven months pregnant, and moving into a new place with my fiance. As fate would have it, we moved back to the apartment complex I lived in when I was 16. It was cheap, it was comfortable, and near where my fiance works. We ended up in a unit four buildings down on the east side of the complex, directly across from the bike trail. A week into living there, I went to take out the trash. I would have had my fiance do it, but I wanted to get off my feet, so I waddled outside to the dumpster. The dumpster, which is right next to the bike trail. I close the lid on the dumpster, and after the bang of the lid, I hear someone talking. Look up, and guess who is standing on the bike trail? You guessed it, white guy, mid-thirties, and still wearing the same down coat. He had a cell phone to his ear, but not the new, flat kind, it was an older flip phone, circa 2005 or so. Anyway, he was talking into the phone, and he sounded pissed. He was cussing at someone on the other end, someone named Lauren. But you know how when people have a phone conversation and they tend to duck their heads down and not look at other people? Yeah, he wasn't doing that. He was looking right at me. After a second of this, I started backing up and he started walking toward me. 
After a second, he was off the grass hill and onto the parking lot, and he took the phone from his ear. He then started snapping it into pieces, tearing out the antenna, breaking the screen off, and angrily throwing them all onto the parking lot ground, still looking at me. I turned around and ran back into the building as fast as I could, and I don't remember what happened next. Next thing I knew, I was on a bed in the maternity ward. There was a fetal monitor strapped around me, and I had a saline IV in my arm. My fiancé was there. After a bit of confusion, we worked out this. I came in from taking out the trash, and I was calm. I didn't say anything about the guy with the cell phone. I watched an episode of Battlestar Galactica with my fiancé and started throwing up a bit, which was normal for my pregnant self. But I spiked a pretty nasty fever later, so there we were at 5am in the hospital making sure I was okay. All this time, apparently, I was perfectly alert and on the way to the hospital, I apparently talked about our plans for the upcoming Christmas. I was discharged an hour later. They said I had the flu. They gave me Tamiflu and told me to sleep it off and stay indoors. When we pulled into the apartment parking lot, I got out of the car and looked for the cell phone he dropped. It was there, but it looked like it had been run over, probably by us, and was cracked into dozens of pieces. I collected what I could, and it looks like it was a Nokia 6085. This happened in December 2012. Today is Monday, September 9th, 2013. I have not seen the man in the down coat since then, until this morning. My fiancé, yet still not married, leaves for work at 6 a.m. Not working until 1 p.m. myself, I'm usually still asleep at this point. Around 8 a.m., I got up and put a robe on because somebody was knocking on our door. Shasta was growling at the door, which was a little unusual. She will typically bark at people, but never growl. I told her to go to her kennel, and she sulked away, and I answered the door. I should have looked through the peephole first, but I didn't, and I cannot express how much I regret that. The man in the coat was on the other side. I remember seeing him, and I remember wondering, why is he still wearing that coat in this weather? But after that, I remember nothing. I woke up an hour and a half ago, sitting at my kitchen table. The first thing I noticed was how unbearably hot it was in the apartment. I went to the thermostat and found that it had been set to 90 degrees and was blowing out hot air. I wasn't wearing my robe anymore, I was dressed for the day in my work uniform, and I'm getting ready to leave soon. My baby, now 7 months old, was in her crib. She was crying, evidently not having been fed or changed. There was pee all over her bed, as her diaper had leaked. Shasta was laying by the crib, whimpering. I fed the baby, got her changed, and checked my dog for any injuries. She wasn't hurt. I'm not hurt either, but there is blood on the floor by my doorway. I wonder if Shasta bit the man. I don't know, he's gone, and from what I can tell, nothing has been stolen from the place. What do I do now? Edit, in case it's not obvious, I seem to have lost an hour and a half in this last encounter. It was 8.07am when I got up, and by the time I had the sense to check the clock again, it was about 9.45. Due to the level of detail the user provided, it seems unlikely that the story was made up for attention. In fact, nobody in the thread accused her of lying at any point, which is pretty rare in online forums. Most people immediately recognize the uploader's problems as symptoms of a serious neurological issue. I'd go to the doctor. I really, really hope not, but what if you have a brain tumor? It could cause some vivid hallucinations. Also, losing time is typical of a seizure. It could be many things, but I hope it's really just something that has nothing to do with health. Could be the man in the white coat is your brain communicating that you're about to have a seizure. I'm with the others. You need to visit a neurologist. Unfortunately, since the account that made the post has been deleted, there was no way for me to find any potential updates made by the uploader. However, she didn't reply to any of the comments made on the thread she started, which means she was either able to get the help she needed, or something ended up happening to her.